Welcome to the official Warrior Podcast from Max. I'm Lisa Ling, a journalist and Warrior superfan. And I'm Hoon Lee. You may know me as the actor who plays a child, the friend to everyone, and I'm also a writer on the series. As your host, we'll be breaking down every episode of Warrior Season 3, and we'll learn more about how this incredible new season came together through interviews with the creators, cast, and crew. We'll also be discussing the very real historical facts and people that inspired the characters and story of Warrior, including Bruce Lee, whose writings inspired the entire series. Today, we're diving into Episode 8, Know When You're Losing a Fight, written by Queen. Hey, that's hey, me! And we're also going to be joined today by Diane Doan, who plays Mai Ling, and we're going to talk with Diane about power, survival, and love in Warrior. Oh, and this is so exciting. This is your first episode ever that you've written for TV. It's is that right? It's true. It's true, which explains the quality. No, how it's, did, it's <laughs> something I'm very, very proud of. I've had a lot of support through it, and it was just a thrill. And and when did you communicate to the brass that you wanted to get to write an episode? I suppose if you asked Jonathan, he'd probably tell you I've been communicating that in subtle, subliminal ways ever since I started working with him by just not so subtly suggesting line changes and adjustments to my characters. But <laughs> I would say towards the middle of season two, I just realized that I... I was so enamored of this show. It meant so much to me that I wanted to be involved sort of as deeply as I could. So I just kind of put it out there. And Jonathan, he's always been a very open collaborator. He's always sort of looked to try to buoy people up. And we'd had enough history that I think he trusted me. So he basically auditioned me with a, a script outline, uh, which I wrote up for him as a sort of a test case. And I'm so happy that it worked out. Well, and and this is a big episode. So much happens. That's true. I don't want to spoil this. So if you haven't watched episode eight yet, stop listening to us right now and go watch it. We'll be here when you're ready. Here is the episode recap. Mai Ling and Leong get married with both Tongs in attendance. At the wedding banquet, Kong Pak pulls Leong aside and asks him to help the elders curb Mai Ling's power. They're ready to fight for control of the Tong, but it doesn't have to come to that. They will listen to you if you will listen to them. We're only thinking of what's best for the Tong, including Mai Ling. She would be touched by her concern. Father June, momentarily lucid, tells Young June that he feels himself slipping away. When you've scrapped as much as I have, you know when you're losing the fight. He advises him to be wary of Assam. Suspecting betrayal, Mai Ling orders her council of elders killed on their wedding night without Leong's knowledge. While Mai Ling and Leong consummate their marriage, Long Zi assassins kill the elders. Kong Pak survives the massacre and confronts Mai Ling. Kong Pak, what is this? Wu Jin and the other elders are dead. I barely survived! I offered you friendship and a seat at the table and you betrayed me. You tried to turn my own husband against me. Leong, open your eyes. If you won't stop her, get out of the way, and I will. Leong is forced to fight his old friend to the death while Mai Ling watches. Kung Pak dies in Leong's arms. While Leong cradles his slain friend, Mai Ling tells Leong that Kung Pak would have destroyed them and that she chose this for both of them. Leary wants the two Irish guys who robbed a Chinese merchant out of jail. He enlists Bill to help, and they head to the police station to pay the boys fines and release them. They open the cell just as Atwood comes in with a few of his loyalists. Atwood makes a deal. If Bill knocks him down, the boys can go. If not, then Bill will join them behind bars. Look, if you think I'm stupid enough to fight the chief of police... <laughs> The fight commences, which attracts a crowd of cops watching the brawl. Bill knocks Atwood out, and the boys are let go out of prison. Wang Chao advises Leong that Mai Ling is using him for protection. Hey, I'm not saying she doesn't love you. But I am saying she can't do this without you. 
Like I said, Hoon, so much happens in this episode. Tell me about writing it. What was it like for you? And we've talked on the podcast before about how Chow can move through so many different spaces in the show and gets to interact with a lot of characters. And I can imagine by the time you started writing this, you knew a lot about these characters. Um, you just you knew them so well. What was the most challenging part for you? Honestly, it was the absolute terror that I was going to let down the people who were doing so much to sort of support me. I do feel like I have a really close relationship with the vast majority of the cast. I felt like I knew them as people and I knew them as actors. And it was something where I was excited to potentially craft some part of the story that would allow them to explore different corners of their character in some small way. You know, generally as actors, I think we're kind of asked to do, you know, 50% of what any actor is probably capable of doing. So anytime you can crack that open a little bit and just create a little daylight that the actor can run to, I, I think that's a, a lovely opportunity. So I was excited by that possibility, but equally in proportion to that excitement was just this deep-seated terror that it wouldn't even be bad. That would even just that would just indicate I had completely missed the mark. Just that it would be very, very, you know, meh for everybody and that they just wouldn't be excited about it at all. Well, it was hardly May. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, was there anything about just the process of writing this that you found really surprising? Yeah, you know, I, I have had conversations subsequently with the other writers, and they've all nodded along with this, so I assume it's a pretty common phenomenon. But one question I had was, when you're putting the script together, you see the scenes very clearly. I think if you're doing your job, you really see them as almost mini movies in your mind, finished products. And the better informed you are about the actors and the history of the show, the style of the show, the more completely you can realize that. So I worked very hard to try to get into that state of mind as I wrote the script. And my fear was that it would lead me to a place where I wouldn't be able to accept the reality of what was being filmed that it would create this sort of cognitive dissonance to me. But in fact, what happened was when I saw my castmates do the scenes, those incarnations suddenly seemed like the correct version and that my version on the page was just the blueprint, just a sketch. And what they were materializing was the actual thing. And it was actually incredibly thrilling. I was so glad to have sidestepped any sort of weird control issue that way. And I could just sort of enjoy the collaborative part of the process, you know, very completely. Well, and and you got to write that wedding scene. Yeah. Uh, and and the episode where we really see Mai Ling's conniving. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen her conniving throughout the series, but really she follows through with some pretty damaging things on, on her wedding day. And we are so excited because we are going to be welcoming the sublime Diane Doan, who plays Mai Ling on the show. She was born in British Columbia to parents of Vietnamese descent. Her grandmother is half Chinese, making her one-eighth Chinese. She started technical training and dance at the age of 10 in jazz, lyrical, modern, hip-hop, and tap dance, and has performed as a dancer at the 2010 Winter Olympics opening ceremony and as a backup dancer for Michael Buble. In addition, she has worked as a dancer in music videos for other recording artists like Big Time Rush and Mariana's Trench, and as a dancer on So You Think You Can Dance in Canada. I love So You Think You Can Dance, love Michael Buble. Also good. <laughs> Her breakout acting role was playing Lonnie in the Disney movie The Descendants, which is about the children of all of these major Disney characters. She plays Lonnie, the daughter of Fa Mulan, the main character of Mulan. She reprised this role three times, a sequel to the movie and three spin-off TV series. In addition to Warrior, she's also known for her roles in Vikings, Good Trouble, and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So, let's talk to Diane Doan. Diane, we are so excited to have you on the Warrior podcast. Uh, I have to share a little story with with our audience. By so, the way, for the people who can't see this, <laughs> Diane Doan is swooning. I'm, I'm because she's myself. being interviewed by the great Lisa Lynn. Oh, stop. And she might lose it. That's why the story is particularly funny and fun. Um, so my husband and I, as we know, are obsessed Warrior fans. And after we watched season one, we were at a party for Sandra O oh, of all people. And Diane walks in. And Paul and I both look at each other and we're like, oh, my Ling. <laughs> and we just proceed to basically attack her because we are so excited 
to I, meet her. Well, I saw their shocked faces. I didn't hear the My Ling part. <laughs> and I thought Sandra had arrived behind me. <laughs> and so I quickly turned and I'm like, oh my gosh, what, what are the, who are they talking, looking at? What? And then we proceeded to make eye contact. I'm like, well, surely it's not me. And I kept looking around and then you and Paul came up to me and I started profusely sweating. Oh, come on. Because you were so kind. Lisa, I was freaking out. And then I'm like grabbing on to Manny. I'm like, you need to come here right now. And look who's talking to us. Just as a spoiler, this podcast is 40 minutes of this. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny because when you get so absorbed in a show and in a character, you just you just think that's that's who they are. And so as we're talking to you, we're like, well, she's a she's just this real like she's this real person who is just so sweet. And your character, Mai Ling, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't exactly characterize her as sweet. <laughs> like, we're so surprised that you're not just like filled with murderous blind the ambition. Devil spawn. <laughs> So that brings me to my first question. Um, what did you think of My Ling when you first read the script? And and how would you describe this character? It's so funny because I feel like I'm fighting people off whenever they call me, you know, the villain or evil or she's such a bitch and all these things. And I'm like, well, you really knew where she came from. <laughs> it came from a place of survival. And this hunger for power, I saw as a survival tactic to not ever go back to where she came from. And that's what I always tell people about Stalin. And no one listens. <laughs> oh gosh, no one listens. On. Um, <laughs> but but the funny thing is, if if you were to watch My Ling from seasons one, into two and now with three there's been this beautiful evolution of a woman in front of my eyes and very much I feel like life imitates art art imitates life where season one my link came up from it was a, a place of like pure fear you know being a woman in Chinatown she was very much at the bottom she married the leader of Long Z and and to kind of climb that power ladder, if you will, I felt like, and who knows this, my experience filming season one was like, just survive. Don't get fired. Prove that you deserve to be here or that they made the right choice. Oh my God, they're going to see. It was just imposter syndrome. So my experience was so much aligned with what my Ling was going through. It was just like, adrenals going the whole like pumping through the whole season and same with season two very much that and now we turn this page and what we lived all collectively lived through the past few years with this pandemic and I made the active decision going into season three not knowing what they were going to write for me as a character of like I know my place here I'm going to take on this leading female role and embrace it and just try to have the best time. And I had the best time doing season three. And I can like, I'm so proud and I'm not going to get emotional because I am very emotional. <laughs> That's a total lie. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of times he's seen me cry with snot coming out of my nose <laughs> is alarming. Hoon, yes, Hoon and I, I'm so, we are very. I put on a particular hoodie. when they... <laughs> Black and waterproof. Yeah, that's. Um, but I'm really proud of both my experience and of our show collectively and what we've been through. That Diane, that's a testament to your acting abilities. I mean, the fact that you are such an emotional person, right? But I like this notion of even of my Ling even being able to cry because she has enveloped herself mm -hmm. in this survival mode, tough exterior is, is, is pretty powerful to think about. I mean, listen, if the, if there was a note from JT or Josh and everything, like you are not allowed to cry, I'd be like, you got the wrong girl. Like I'm not that good an actor. I can't, that stuff <laughs> doesn't. Yes. But th that's very, but kind. she is a character that has gotten hard or, or has felt she has to be hard. Yes. Um, and fierce and strong in order to survive mm -hmm. and to even bury that horrific trauma mm -hmm. that she endured while she was in China. And I think in seasons one and two, there was this boundary or this wall that was put up for my Ling, but also me as an actor. And it really did affect, I mean, you know, you, 
I'm not a method actor. I don't claim to be. But I would bring that stuff home. I mean, you really live through some of this trauma and it's hard to shake off when you're so far removed from home and you're we're in Cape Town five months a year. Like that's a long time to be separated by anyone who grounds you, you know, your identity. Um, that was something that I had to work through and I actively worked on letting go in season three. And you're often asked to do incredibly um, deep work in that way you know, the, the types of situations that my Ling has mm. to contend with. And, you know, you're doing that all day. You're working through these scenes all day and the body doesn't know the difference. You know, it just right. knows it's in an emotional state and it's reacting appropriately. And then you go home and you like try to watch the Simpsons or whatever. And it's, you, you don't, you aren't able to just shed it um, that easily. I laid in bed for th three and a half weeks during season one and watched seven seasons of Chicago PD. Oh my God. Just That's so seven much Chicago seasons. PD. How many episodes can someone calculate that? Over a hundred episodes. Just put it on and then Hoon and his beautiful family would be like, come to dinner. And I would just be like, oh, I'm really tired today. Looking back, maybe a year and a half later, did I realize it was this bout of depression that I put myself into from like how heavy my ling is. And, you know, it, it's so... It's not silly because I don't want to downplay it, but I'm like, I think about, oh, but it's only a few scenes an episode or, you know, it's only 10 episodes of television. That's not much. And then, but truly, you're right. What we put our minds and our bodies, the situations that we put ourselves in, it's, it's, it's hard. But it's also like saying for, say, an athlete. Yeah. That's kind of like saying, oh, well, it's only... 10 seconds to do this 100 yard dash right. it's all the training and preparation beforehand right. all of the sort of um, conditioning that you have to do to get yourself into the right place you know all the recovery you have to do later as well and that's not to make this sound like it's just huge no, and traumatic no no thing, no it's not of course but i think right. it's sometimes when you're not someone who does it a lot you don't necessarily know what the impact is um and then even for people that do it a lot, it's easy to sometimes underestimate it or to, mm. to you know, make assumptions about how you'll react. Mm -hmm. Well, so where would you say Mai Ling is in season three? Like, is she still reacting or acting out of fear or is she now all about sort of straight ambition? I'm so happy with Myling's arc this season because I do feel like there is this lightness about her. There is, you got to see a little bit of charisma come out of her and these tones and these colors that I've never been able to play with Myling yet. And I do feel like it's a place where she's so comfortable now in her position of power. I'm not saying it's greed at this point, but she's she's now so set and sure of her loyalty and love that Leong has for her and this unwavering support from him that he's never going to leave her. And so she pushes that boundary to, you know, the bitter end. But now it's just about conquering for her. What more can she want? What more can she grasp in order to keep her position of power? I think that there's a, that... She represents really, to me, this sort of uh, this liminal zone that can sometimes uh, occur. So you have somebody who maybe is motivated initially by a sense of protection and mm -hmm. a sense of like, I'm never going to be put in that position again. And in order to do that, they expand their circle of safety and they keep expanding that circle of safety. And you have to ask the question, when is it turned into something else? When does it become a sort of avarice or a sort of a grasping that is almost habitual as opposed to motivated by something, you know, specific and deep seated. And I think that's the danger that Leong really senses is that Leong is an incredibly self-aware centered person. And, you know, that's the sort of thing that he would be very sensitive to, I think. And, uh, and there was always this implicit question, which is we encounter her when she's already uh, married to Long Zi, but there's a journey to get there from this girl who had nothing. And she's not going to be hacking and slashing her way to the top. She has to be charming. She has to be someone who can play that game and who can uh, engender true love because Long Zi's not a fool and Leong's not a fool. So if they were foolish, then you would be like, she's tricked them. But in earning the love of these powerful men, she has to also be worthy of love. And so you have to show that. And also 
I feel like there's this unwavering love with Assam. I mean, she will do anything for her brother, anything. I know people question that, but ultimately, you know, everyone's like, well, you tried to have him killed and they keep bringing that back all season. I will That's say. That's a good point. Let's be fair. <laughs> but, but she didn't, you know what I mean? Like she, yeah. how ample warning, get out. I want you out. I want you nothing to do with the hop way. Like she has protected him through and through and has done everything to keep that relationship possible um and that's i feel like that that push and pull has been three seasons worthy up until this point you know the bond between brother and sister yeah. right is another that's that connection right he like as uh, i think chow actually says at one point like you cross the salt to find her like it's such a bare statement of fact the sacrifice involved you mm -hmm. know those journeys were hellish and we don't see it we see him come off the boat but whether that was motivated by senses of guilt on his part, et cetera, as we learn in, in season, uh, earlier seasons, you have two siblings that are both wrestling with this question. And actually, it's very much uh, illuminated by Mai Ling and Leong's relationship and Mai Ling's perspective on Leong. Because Leong's perspective is kind of clear, mm. you know, from the outset. And we have questions about Mai Ling's perspective and how that starts to change, et cetera. And so I wanted to ask you, actually... Um, die it's like when you were approaching the the question of the wedding etc um, and the question of like why she was doing it did you have an internal sort of version of your story uh of my link's story as to how this was all going to play out because we know that in the actual consummation of the wedding yeah there's a bunch of assassinations that take place yes i it was interesting when it came up because i didn't know I think I, I made peace with like, well, my Ling's going to be at the top and the Tong leader. And maybe she doesn't need a man. She's very clear about that. She doesn't need to be associated with a husband or like, because now she is that for herself. Um, I do. I thought it was beautiful. It coming after um, having everything again, stripped everything she worked herself up to, to never be in that place again, happened when she was thrown in jail, that whole um, delousing scene. I mean, she's rock bottom again. And I feel like rocked to her core. And because of that, it was interesting reading those scripts being like, at the end of the day, she's a woman and human and that love and that tenderness she still yearns for. And political or not, I didn't see it as political. Mm -hmm. It was truly... I love you and I see you and I know everything you've done for me. And that admission of like being indebted to him, you've never heard her say. It came from the most beautifully vulnerable, heartfelt place. And I didn't think she would go there. I didn't think there would be a wedding. I remember when JT called me and told me, you know, heads up, this is fun and exciting. I was like, I couldn't imagine why it would get there. Right. Because I'm like, well, don't put me with a man. I don't need, you know, like my ego came up being like, really? <laughs> I'm at the top already. I don't need. But it made complete sense. And that's where I approached it. It wasn't political for my Ling. You know, it, I was just thinking about this because we uh, talked to Olivia. And, you know, after what Atoy goes through mm. in the vineyard, we <sighs> see this moment of her coming back to Chinatown and reclaiming her position as a sort of... Putting on that mask. Right, mm. right, exactly. So powerful. Refortifying, you know. Oof. And I was thinking that, like, in a way, it's sort of a... Re it's, it's an echo of an origin story. We kind yeah. of see how she came to be, yeah. the version that we meet, even at the top of the, of the story. Yeah. And seeing my Ling in prison is something like that as well, where we see her at sort of a low point we've never seen before, but this is the thing they've talked about that she started from nothing. But even before that, when she's in the Pendleton's home. That's right, yeah. And she really thinks that she has gotten over, or she's crossed to the other side. Yeah. And in an instant, the tables were turned. That was another um, storyline that I had trouble. I would go back and forth and I would talk to Evan and Josh about being like, where's the line between my Ling's um, power moves like this chess play that she's doing versus I don't want, I don't want there to be an air of like, she's not naive, but I loved the idea of her having hope and 
you know, this, this new, bright, shiny world that she's never had the privilege to enter. And maybe I do belong. And I, I, I can make a future for myself here and I can have friends. I don't have any, you've never seen my Ling until this season really have any female friendship between that one scene with Atoy. And, it, and we picked at it in season two at the, um, the, w when I'm bandaging her up during the riot, but this, there's like a child in my Ling that came out with, with this, the pond and the idea of the pond. But at the same time, I, I just wanted, I was like, I don't want it to come across as calculated and menacing. I'm, I'm sure it felt good to my Ling to feel this kind of validation. Yeah. Or, or there was these things like um, going to the gallery. Yeah. And I was, I, I took, it was Dustin directed the episode and I believe it was Evan, Dustin Wing. Oh my gosh. And um, <laughs> <laughs> guys, I could be giddy about our whole cast all day, but I believe it was Evan on set. I could be wrong, but I took him aside and I'm like, even watching the duck world relax and their their way of enjoying life and specifically when Eliza and her husband and when my Ling sees them she's never seen PDA in public just affection of any sort that tender lovingness and I feel like I had to ask him being like you know I'm this is how I'm gonna play it this like I'm shy I, I shouldn't be what this is taboo very much in our Asian culture like um it's very child luck, I feel like, this experience in the duck world. Um, and it's all very new, again, colors for my Ling, and it was so fun to play. I think there were mechanisms, too, which um, allowed for opportunities, which I think you took. Mm -hmm. You know, my Ling has access because of her language, for example, and right. we've made it explicitly clear that Leong does not. And so even when, when my Ling is in the Pendleton's world or sitting with the white women, et cetera, in many ways, even though she's in the heart of the Longzi headquarters, she's unobserved. So she can reveal something in safety hmm. and she doesn't allow Leong to accompany her, right? So in a way, she's found this place where she can create a new uh, dialogue. Right. So and I think that that's the opportunity for the playing of it to be sincere because you aren't being watched for the first time. You don't have to be the queen, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. And I think that and up until that moment, yeah. she's successful. That's right. She gets invited to th that's things right. yeah. repeatedly. And so she's almost, you know, if you're thinking about this as a child, mm -hmm. you know, she's she is getting that approval mm -hmm. from the adults and that feels really good. Mm -hmm. So I think, I, I, and I think that diet, you really took that on. You were like, this is, it, it may have, again, it, it's not a mutually exclusive thing. It may have a political ramification, right. but it doesn't mean it's insincere. It doesn't right. mean that it's an act, not an actual extension. So I thought that was great. Uh, I'm very intrigued by my Ling's relationship with Mayor Buckley. <laughs> um, Gross, sexy. <laughs> no, no. Oh God, no. no. <laughs> Please don't, don't ever write that no. in. <laughs> Not because. Oh my God. Well, I'm saying it as Miling if I'm and so... Buckley in the carriage. <laughs> oh, I have sworn off all sexy scenes for the rest. My Ling is retired. <laughs> <laughs> She's joined the nunnery. It's done. We're over it. We've seen it. We've done it. Talk about a departure. No, with Buckley, I will say, Langley and I always joke, it's like, we just meet each other in carriages, you know, mm -hmm. three or four times a season. We say hi. We have a little flirtation <laughs> back and forth. And then we'll see him again in a couple months. That's a fun relationship. It, it is. Well, I mean, it is because, and yeah. Wailing is so sharp because she knows how he sees her. Mm -hmm. But yet she also knows that he needs her. And she is able to play those cards just... Yeah so sharply. You're right. I feel like taking advantage of what Hoon said with my language. And then I don't know if any, the audience catches on, but I'm very acutely aware of like what my Ling wears to see Buckley, mm -hmm. the red lips, you know, that's very, we, we veered off of it in season two and three, but only when I go see Buckley, it's a red lip and it's very much a power move. It's like, um, asserting my dominance as a, a, a sexual woman 
And I know how Asian women are seen. I know how he's going to see me. And it's these little power plays that we have against one and another that it's just been, they're, they're fun scenes to shoot. But yeah, I'm very acutely aware of like, my Ling knows what she's doing. In a lot of ways, it's almost like that relationship really works because with that particular pairing, it's like, there is no emotion involved. No. You know, so it's like a purely pragmatic, let's get the thing done that we want to get done. Right. However that, however that needs to happen. Well, we, we have two episodes left to go. Yes. How should we be thinking about Mai Ling's relationship with Leong after she has just murdered <laughs> all of his confidants. Mm -hmm. Which, let's be honest, that's a pretty big faux pas. <laughs> pretty big. I mean, what did they really do? <laughs> so I murdered your best friend. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, technicality. The, the, the first Look at time, you. It's Look how uncomfortable it's you are. formality. First, the first there. time he actually has a relationship with another man. Yeah, but I didn't kill him, technically. True, but you it tried to. It wasn't at to, my hands, Lisa. You it's tried only because to, you Ling. failed to kill him. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're stronger than I thought. Hey, you need to give him more credit. He does a lot of neck workout. <laughs> By the way, can we talk about Mark? Yes, let's talk about Mark because he's fantastic. a dream boat yeah. of a human being. He really is. The most lovely, incredible, has been in the industry for how many decades? He loves acting so much. I didn't know what to expect. I just assumed he was over it and, like, didn't want to talk <laughs> acting. You know, like, yeah. keeps to himself on set. I, I won't talk to him. I won't make eye contact. He was the opposite of that. Yeah. He came in, was so supportive from the get-go, was almost grateful to be part of our show, whereas all of us were like, are you... <laughs> We're like, what are you doing here? What are here? you talking about? <laughs> Did something happen? Something. <laughs> but yet you try to kill him. I tried yeah. to kill him. That's the rule in our show. The lovelier you are. <laughs> he crossed me. I couldn't trust him. I knew he was, an, you know, a voice in Leong's ear. Yeah, I don't feel great about it, you guys. <laughs> Leong's other, only, only real confidant. There was In some, three seasons of Warrior. We can edit this out, right? There was some tension between the two of them. Oh, yeah? Some gorgeous male tension? Oh, sexual tension. Yes! Oh, yeah, that for okay, sure. Okay, great! Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought <laughs> you meant like animosity. No, I did this. No, I no, crossed no. my fingers. But I couldn't tell whether that was just me being aroused. <laughs> no, I think the first scene when Joe, who... Look, let, let's be honest. When Joe has his shirt off, it's there's just tension. insane. Yeah. And they oil him up in a way. I'm not there on set, so I can't speak to that. <laughs> I can't confirm nor deny. Well, I've oiled him up once. And <laughs> you have? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Joe would just go. He'd come to set or the stunt tent, and he would, like, run on the treadmill for 25 minutes, jog. He'd just do, like, a couple push-ups. And then when I see him shirtless, I'm like, that's what you were working on? I Not to objectify, I, but I, I am objectifying. I bet, it's, I bet it's a front. I bet he goes back to his apartment. And just, it's just like training for eight for hours. hours. Zillion he's taking pictures of all the junk food he's eating, but he's not eating <laughs> he's it. Not. They're empty. Those bags are empty. That man and his, it's insane. But anyways, he looked fantastic. I spotted some sexual oh, yeah. tensions between the two. <laughs> I mean, I think people will be shipping Leong and I and think Pong so Pong. too. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that was going to be edited in that way, but I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay. I dig it. Well, so the question is, <laughs> have, has My Ling just pushed him over the edge? Leon? Yes. A hundred percent. I feel like there's no, and I, um, I mean, he took, so episode eight, he took his jacket off and walks away. I feel like that was another <gasps> moment. And I did message you mm -hmm. and I was like, what are you doing? Because and I said, who is this? <laughs> I set him up every time. Um, it was one of those moments where I'm like, she's gone too far. My, there is no coming back from this. And the ramifications of losing Leong and what does that mean for her? Because he is all she has in terms of protection, she, confidant, love, everything. And so I, you know, and, and as a cast, we got our episodes very late this season. And so not knowing what comes next, I was like, oh my God, well, this is it for my Ling. This is the most vulnerable she's going to be. This is the time to come after her. What was really key for me in the scene uh, when uh, Leong kills Kong Pak is that, uh, that my Ling makes an entreaty to him as to why she did it, knowing she's crossed the line, knowing that she might have broken him. 
she has to try to reach him. And that has to play completely sincerely because whether the audience believes it or not, my Ling believes that she was acting in their best interest. I did it for us. Yeah, I did it for us. Yeah. And I feel like that that's 100% on Diane to sell, which I think she did magnificently. But if that doesn't play, she's a different person. Mm. You know, if it does play, she's a flawed, damaged human that was trying to get to the promised land, like almost there, almost to this place where she could be happy and in love and at peace and in control, all of the things she needs. And it just didn't quite work out because of the tremendous neck strength of Kong Pak. So I guess we have to wait until episode nine and 10 to find out whether... If I live or die. <laughs> whether she has, in fact, pushed him completely off the edge. Yeah. I mean, there really is no going back for the relationship. And that was something where I'm like... Or is there? We had one night of wedded bliss. And that was <laughs> it. You had to take that away from me. Or did you? <laughs> it's a good season. It's such I'm a good so season. I'm so proud of this season. It was also a great episode, Hoon. So thank you That's for... That's very kind of you. <laughs> He's uncomfortable. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. He's like, deflect, deflect. It really is, and so sets the tone for the next, so to be continued. Well, we have one more question before you go. As you obviously know, this whole show comes about because of the, the initial treatment by Bruce Lee. Mm. And one of the things we're asking the guests is, what is your relationship with uh, Bruce Lee's sort of philosophy of being like water? Is there a moment when you felt that was particularly relevant? Is there some aspect that you you apply to your life, um, this sort of idea? Be water, my friend. <laughs> um, I, I do. I think about it a lot, and I'm still working on it. How I interpret be water is what he said about his mind and not allowing ourselves to be trapped in a certain mindset. And I feel like you know, with mental health and everything, that is something I'm actively working on is not allowing myself to be in spaces of negativity or thinking that I can only be one thing and and being more open and free because it's already a really fucked up world out there. And yeah, to be water is um, fluidity. I'm going to start my own, which is going to be be like dirt. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> well, plants can grow. You see, you see where I'm going with this. It's going to work. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. Diane, this was awesome. Oh, thank thanks, you so guys. much. Thank this you. Is, thank you for having me. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Now I can stop sweating. <laughs> That's it for us. Until next time, we'd like to thank the lovely Diane Doan for joining us today. Yes, join us next time where we discuss episode nine. We're so close to the finale. And Almost speak to Andrew done. Koji again. And Kong Pak rises from the dead. Mark DeCascos will be joining us. Ah, the legendary Mark DeCascos. We're back with a new podcast after every new episode of Warrior, so come back for more as soon as you've watched episode nine. So good. Stream new episodes of Warrior Thursdays only on Max and listen to the podcast on Max and wherever you listen to podcasts. See you soon. Musical transition. Hey, y'all. The official Warrior podcast is a Max podcast produced by the Mashup Americans. It is executive produced by Amy S. Choi and Rebecca Lair. Our producers are Sarah Pellegrini and Thomas Liu. Our development producer is Nicole Kelly. Our production manager is Shelby Sandlin. The show is mixed by Pedro Rafael Rosado.